Your RGB is actually damaging your PC. OpenAI and YouTube are gonna scuffle and AMD making sure that they're supporting more stuff on their upcoming RX 8000 series. Let's get in the hot news, everybody. I'm your bright host. We're going to be going over the hottest tech news I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast this Monday, April 8th, 2024. We're going to start off today talking about a series of Reddit posts that popped up with people showing off their graphics cards that have been burnt by their RGB RAM. This appears to be a little bit of a problem and kind of a coincidence that multiple people posted about this for the first time in years within 48 hours hours of each other. So this is showing off multiple versions of GPUs, whether that's an RTX 40 series, RTX 30 series, or even a GTX 1080 Ti, showing that they have these little burn marks that are appearing in the backplate of their graphics card. You'd see this MSI 3080 that has it, as well as this Gigabyte 4080 that has it. And according to reports and speculation by everybody on the internet, this might be due to some of the UV radiation that certain frequencies of RGB is putting off on those RAMs sticks and causing it to sear into what is lesser quality paint on a backplate, something that GPU manufacturers probably haven't had to worry about for very long. So it's you could call it lesser quality, but if you didn't need to have it resistant to UV light previously and this wasn't an issue before, it's like the quality itself isn't really the, the concern here. But it's also appearing on things like a 10 series. Most of the RAM that I'm seeing posted in all of these pictures is the G-Skill Trident Z. That appears to be one of the more common culprits, at least in these images. So the speculation, it's the UV light that's being put off by certain colors. Potentially the purple color is the most to blame, but it's not necessarily uh, just restricted to that. However, I've owned G-Skill Trident Z RGB RAM since the very beginning. I've had it in so many systems with so many graphics cards, and maybe it's the fact that I have not kept a system for the four years that five, six years that this RAM's been out, so I don't have the long-term effects being seen, but I've I've never personally seen this happen in a single system. But let me know if you have. Let's uh, let's get the community discussing this. Has RGB damaged your GPU? Let me know down below while I let you know about what goes below my mouth into my stomach with today's video sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Soylent, the world's most perfect food that is absolutely not made of people. Since I can't seem to escape being sick and actually had a case of strep throat this month, after recovering from COVID at the end of February, I'm glad I had Soylent on hand to give me a great nutrient and plant-based protein kick to my morning. My absolute favorite flavor, Cafe Mocha, was a non-negotiable part of my morning routine. Getting that caffeine plus the delicious goodness of Soylent is everything I need. And Soylent's great because they put in the work through rigorous research, clinical trials, and formulas rooted in science to give you the most nutrient-packed drink possible. You won't find a single fat ingredient in a Soylent drink. Every ingredient is handpicked to work in synergy with one another. On top of being packed with nutrients, Soylent is also just delicious. Their Kantar Research Award-winning formula consistently comes out on top when pitted against competitors on creaminess, smoothness, and taste. You can improve your diet today and check out Soylent via the link in the video description. The first five 500 people to click our link and use code UFDTech25 will receive 25% off their subscription with Soylent. As always, a huge thank you to Soylent for sponsoring and providing me with my Soylent uh, addiction at this point because I, I, I have the mocha, my wife drinks the creamy chocolate, and we're going through the cases that they're sending. It's amazing. If you ever think, man, I wish I could drink Soylent while driving around and not keeping my eyes on the road. Well, I would need somebody else to drive me around. Well, no, you don't, because Tesla's robo taxis are coming out on August 8th, according to Elon Musk. That was a weird segue, but I just went with it. This is coming after it was reported by Reuters that Elon and Tesla are scrapping the $25,000 EV that was supposed to come out. Elon accused Reuters of lying again and then subsequently went on to put out the tweet that, yes, the Tesla robo taxi will be unveiled on August 8th of this year. The Tesla robo taxi, in case you're just now hearing of it, it has a long history. It was announced way back in, I think, 2018, 2019, where Elon said that it would be coming out within a year. And he talked about how current Tesla owners could have a lucrative use case for this, where you could lease your vehicle out to Tesla's robo taxi network, and it would function kind of like Airbnb or Uber on your behalf. And you could make money while you're not using your vehicle because the self-driving that's in these cars could then go out and make it so that you don't have to be 
present while the car goes and earns income on your behalf. And the numbers that they were quoting on it was something ludicrous. It was essentially like a 60% return on investment on whatever car you purchased. And one of the things that would make this possible is the fact that they were going to come out with a $25,000 cheaper EV, which has never manifested. Even the $35,000 that the Model 3 was supposed to start at has constantly gone up. Obviously, inflation has run wild in the world since 2019. So the keeping that price point makes it very difficult. So the fact that Elon is saying that the $25,000 project is canceled, despite the fact that like getting cars that cheap in general is just very difficult. It's kind of curious. We'll, we'll see. Uh, there's a good set of tweets about all of this showing off that like yes it may be unveiled the robo taxi $25,000 EV that Elon's gonna have it might get shown off on August 8th but based on their track record of showing off vehicles and then actually delivering them it looks like this could potentially be something like 2027 is when we see it on based on the average of two and a half years from unveiled date to release but then you still have things like uh the semi uh, not really released. They did do delivery, so that's harder to say. It's not a mis mass production. Roadster 2.0 got shown off December 14th, 2017. They took $50,000 from prospective buyers, and they have still not released that, nor have they given that an ETA of release. It remains to be seen how all of this is going to play out, but I personally uh, am just going to watch. I'm just going to watch and see what happens. A $25,000 EV, what I think would be great for the US market, if any Anybody could actually pull it off. It is Tesla with their logistics, but they've also had a whole lot of misses over the last few years. Like you could talk about the Cybertruck and it being audacious and very difficult to manufacture and all of that. But like also one of the things that I think people aren't talking as much about is the fact that Tesla came out with their 4680 batteries and they haven't been doing what Elon promised they were gonna do. There's the structural battery pack, the actual usefulness of the batteries and how they were gonna enable things like five, six, 700 mile range in their Teslas didn't happen. The 4680s are just like the, the 2170s, I believe is what's in the current vehicles. Uh, it It's just like roughly the same. But what's not the same is the internet as a whole. And we're now we're seeing a lot of the different scuffles that are gonna be coming out due to the training data that's being used in a lot of these large language models. OpenAI, who makes ChatGPT, is at the forefront of a lot of these. They are currently under a lawsuit from the New York Times. And so the New York Times is actually publishing a little bit about how chat GPT was made. One of the things that was involved is that both Google and OpenAI have been using YouTube to train their text algorithms. Now Google owns YouTube, so you would think fair game, but with OpenAI, they used over 1 million hours of transcribed YouTube videos to train their large language model. This is coming after a Bloomberg interview with OpenAI where the CTO was directly asked, hey, how do you train this Sora project that you use? Like, is it YouTube videos? And the CTO just kind of squirms and doesn't really answer the question and says if they're publicly available, they have trained their model on it, which like brings up a whole large question in general of like what is on the internet is that technically publicly available if it's hosted on YouTube servers? Yes, the public can access it as long as they agree to the terms of service of accessing that stuff. It's not open to the public. Let's say something in the public domain would be public domain movies like Steamboat Willie is something different, that's public. The public owns that now, in, in the US at least, versus publicly consumed videos like on YouTube, other companies don't technically have the ability to access that, which is something that the CEO of YouTube has said, is that you're violating the terms of service if Sora or otherwise has been training on the data of the videos that we've published because it's not actually publicly available, it's privately held. I upload my videos to YouTube and enter in an agreement with them that they will distribute them. All of this is getting wild and confusing and kind of uh, gonna have to play out in the courts, honestly, because the large language models are only as good as their input data. And if a lot of the input data was taken from sources that are not consenting and they have to strip their models of that data, it could potentially change how it is moving forward. But one of the things that's coming out is that there are companies that are licensing it more effectively, like Shutterstock has agreed to essentially everybody under the sun to give them their photos. The Apple has now been reported as one of them, OpenAI, Meta, Google, and Amazon have all trained on their images 
images for their image generation stuff, which you've seen because like there's shutter stock labels in certain places. And so it's a chaotic time out on the internet and we'll see how chaotic Reese is today. Let's let's see what he whips up for you. Yo, welcome back to EFT Deals, bringing the hottest tech deals out on the internet. Happy Monday, everyone. Hope you guys had a good weekend and hey, deals. Starting off today, we have this Razer Basilisk V3 wired gaming mouse for only $49.99, making it $20 off. But then for the same price, you can pick up this Kuryu 24 inch 1080p 75 hertz monitor for also $49.99, making it $34 off and a great way to finish your hack man setup if you grab multiple. And then lastly, we have the Thermaltake Core P3 open air case for only $99.99, making it $40 off. And with that, the deals are done. You can find these and more linked in the video description down below. But until next time, I'm gonna hand you back to Brett for the rest of your hot news. Cheers. Well, Reese, here's how Roku gives people a killer deal on their televisions. You get them for super cheap, and part of that is because they sell advertisements on the screensavers on the television, so they can subsidize the format of giving you that stuff. And they also have to pay off their Quibi acquisition, which they did a little bit ago. Terrible, terrible decision by that company. But now there's a patent from Roku where they want to inject more ads in places where they don't necessarily have control already, because the screensaver that has the ads that Roku shows is when you're using their app. So they can tell when the app is paused and then they give you a little screensaver with some money-making juice. Well, this new patent is actually trying to track when you leave behind certain things that are connected via HDMI, like your game console. Let's say you put down the controller, you need to grab some Cheetos and Mountain Dew. Well, they're gonna throw on this screensaver with ads so they can make money and you can come back to uh, them making money off of you, even though those ads are just intrusive and you're not actually going to click on them and you don't really care and so is it really effective for the advertisers it must be they continue to pay for it anyways just just get ready for more ads to be shoved down your eyeballs and get ready for more emulators to pop up on ios because apple has now approved worldwide retro emulators being on the app store this is coming after the eu is essentially going to force them to do it anyways but now it's going to happen worldwide instead of just being restricted to the european union Union's iPhones. And even with these retro emulators, you can potentially even download games within the apps, provided that it's not pirated content, it's open source content that you could have within these retro gaming apps. It's something that Apple is now allowing, which is great. This, this is more parody and kind of the EU forcing their hands. I don't necessarily have anything negative to say about this, but I'm curious if you do. Let, let me know down below in the comments how this could be a negative. And I'll let you know how I'm positively excited about AMD's RX 8000 just a little bit. It's starting to gear up that we're looking at a, a closer launch. More and more things are happening, including the fact that the Navi 48 GPU is being found to be added to the Rockham platform, which is a pretty big deal considering the fact that consumer cards only recently got added added to Rockham in the 7900 XTX, XT, and GRE. In case you're not familiar, Rockham, which stands for Radeon Open Compute Platform, is part of AMD's software for professional applications. Think of it like NVIDIA's CUDA. But there's now a patch to Rockham to allow for this Navi 48 GPU, which is just good. It's a good thing to be added, potentially will be for consumers, because you should be able to buy it in whatever the highest end RX 8000 GPU is, should be the Navi 48 card. We've already talked in a previous episode of hot news that this is not expected to even beat the current 7900 xtx that's out on the market but as long as they price it appropriately something that's a 7900 xt performance for 499 i think is where the sweet spot would be that would be good that means a more mid-tier gpu at least based on pricing would be available to be used in rockham and it moves the needle a little bit further in amd becoming more useful in a lot of different scenarios i'm excited for you let me know what you think of it down below while I respond to what you commented on our videos from last week, starting off with Friday's episode of Hot News. We got PC Payload saying Zen 5 will be the typical 15 to 20% faster as it has been with almost every single generational step. And as always, both Intel and AMD feed hype BS well above what turns out to be reality. And then James Gumb saying that 40% is legit in certain workloads with software compiled just right for the CPU. Well, I actually want to bring up somebody else's comment, which helped to clarify what I was trying to say and did not do well, my words. We've got Randy Salzman saying single core uplift in IPC 
3 are two different things. Zen 5 is getting 40% single core uplift, not a 40% IPC uplift. If they were getting 40% in IPC, then they'd be getting a higher percent uplift in single core because single core uplift includes IPC, clock speed, cache, and memory speed slash bandwidth. For just the IPC for Zen 5, it's gonna be closer to 15% over Zen 4. So it, the 40% was in a single benchmark and combining all the things, including clock speed increases, the IPC, which is just how much better is the execution of this new architecture. There are gonna be places where you're gonna see the, the CPU is 40% better than the previous generation. In games, not very likely. Closer to 10, 15% is as good as you're gonna get in the most restricted CPU environments. If you're playing at 4K ultra settings with FSR 3 turned on, probably not gonna see that high of an increase because you're not CPU bottlenecked in a lot of those scenarios. Then Dastin Cool saying, didn't expect this channel to covering the moon time zone. Why not? I cover space stuff a lot. I really enjoy astronomical things and whenever it's tied to tech, especially when it comes to time zones and being able to do things with programming, I'll, I'll cover it. James Webb was a big thing back when that launched, at least covering it here on Hot News. I, I enjoy it and that's why I talk about it. That's essentially the barometer for what gets included on Hot News. And then Aussie Kai saying, turtle balls, which I, Thank you. Then let's talk about some of the other videos that released over the weekend, in case you haven't watched them, maybe go check them out. We released our Ioneo slide review, which did not like that thing very much for reasons that have nothing to do with the internals. It's all about the external stuff that's going on with the Ioneo slide. High tech low life saying, I think not having a headphone jack is totally unforgivable on a device like this. It's not even an ultra thin device either, which is extra insulting. I didn't even think of that. We did not, at any point cover the lack of a headphone jack, I don't think, which is, you're right, that is egregious. Why would they not do it? Although I don't use wired headphones very often, it's still like, it's kind of a mainstream thing. Like if the Steam Deck has it, this thing absolutely could have had it. Then Octagonal Square saying, I think this is the most negative review I've seen from y'all. Then you haven't watched our Samsung Arc review because I hated that thing, hated that monitor. Then Anus McGee saying, zero out of 10 doesn't work in my VCR. The fact that your VCR works at all is, Fantastic. Then yesterday we released Kyler's take on the Thermaltake Tower 300, which is now part of his personal build. It's a wild story. Again, go watch it if in case you haven't yet with Savage Assassin saying, it does look like a popcorn machine though. Then Mr. Blue Brewer saying, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, three times is enemy action, which is regards to the fact that Kyler had a horrible time with that PC, not due to anything that the Tower 300 does, just due to him being him with the slick mix saying Kyle channeling his inner Linus from LTT with all the breaking of things. There, it was a it was a wild thing. And then Alvin and both bro the noob noob saying activate windows, which it's Kyler's system. I'm, he can activate it if he wants. That's up to him. It's it's his computer now. We did a fresh install. OK, maybe maybe he he, he did activate it or, or he will. I don't. It's not, it's his computer. And this is my episode of Hot News being done. I'll see you back here for more of the hottest tech news tomorrow, my friends.